from Meyerson JCC be available for the rest of us to hear eventually? No, they didn't record. <laughs> okay. I'm Sometime when you have an extra few hours with absolutely no external pressures, please record it for us. <laughs> Yeah, the day after Mashiach comes. But I can send you my source sheets. Um, okay, everybody. Chag Sameach, Shabbat Shalom. Um, today, we're going to do something interesting. Not exactly the Parsha. We always do. Connected to yesterday's Torah reading, which is we're going to look at the experience of Sinai. <laughs> and look at the experience of what does it mean to receive Torah? What does it mean even to connect to God? So like big questions. Um, and how does that evolve in the Torah and uh, some in rabbinic midrash? So before we get started, let's say the bracha. Uh, Edith, you can screen share the bracha. Oh, is my video off? You need to see me in both places, not really, right? Um, all right. You didn't have the blessing? Rabbi Dan, my screen share is, is freezing. Do, could we, could okay, we just go ahead and bless? <laughs> Everybody, if you want to unmute, we'll just say the blessing together, okay? People in the room, people on the Zoom, just say the blessing. Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu Melchalam. Blessed are you, divine source of the universe, who has gifted us with Torah and commanded us to soak in your divine wisdom. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Welcome, welcome. I'm talking to people in the room, people on Zoom, new and old. Uh, let's see, here we go. Ah, that does not look good, does it? I'm going to share. Sorry, I'm just trying to figure out how to share my screen. Here we go. Do people see the source sheet? Yes, you do. Okay, good. So we're starting with a poem from my good friend, Rabbi Sharon from Anasov. Pretty sure, Sharon, are you here? No, okay. Hi, good morning. See you. Um, Sharon was here, I asked her to read it. I'm pretty sure she wrote it a while ago. Um, and it's a poem kind of to start opening us up to thinking about how how do we think about Sinai? How do we think about God? How do we think about Torah? We're gonna to all do that in, in one hour, okay? That all. That's all. <laughs> okay, and it's called Devotion. In loving memory of Rabbi Daniel Thomas Barr, who was a reconstructionist rabbi uh, who died years ago. Devotion. Recently, I met a colleague who said to me, we must be absolutely clear. Do you or do you not believe that God gave the Torah to Moses at Mount Sinai? I couldn't help but hear, are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? I thought back to a panel in Jerusalem in the winter of 1988, when someone demanded an answer to the same question. My friend Daniel said, well, it depends what you mean by God, and it depends what you may mean by Gabe, and it depends what you mean by Moses, and it depends what you mean by Sinai, but yes. <laughs> we all laughed, but I knew he was serious, not only about it depends what you mean, but about yes. Is my heart speaking to you? Are you speaking to my heart? Am I seeking you? Are you seeking me? I don't need to know in order to say yes, yes, yes. 
So I absolutely love this poem because it rejects any literal sense of Sinai, God, you know, what happened then. It's like, it doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter what happened historically. Um, I believe something happened and Israelites had some kind of experience and they gave that over in some kind of story. And it reflects some kind of yearning for the cosmic you. I don't even know how else to say it. And it feels awkward to say it in any words to tell the truth, any words whatsoever. But here are words, here are words from my friend Sharon, and then here are words from the tradition. And let's let's ask ourselves what experiences lie behind the words. Like, what are they trying to get at? Whether whether we believe it or not, right? What's the human experience here? Does that make sense as a kind of reframe? Yes? Excellent. Okay. So we're going to source two. Uh -oh. Yes, Nikki, quick comment. And I want to, I want to, I really want to do a bunch of text yeah. before I take comments, but go ahead, Nikki. <laughs> a gentile friend of mine asked, uh, Scientific gentle or gentile? gentile gentile scientist friend of mine uh -huh. said, Where are those tablets? Where are those tablets? Yeah. And I said, What do you mean? Show where, me the evidence. Where where are those tablets? They're in the Torah. <laughs> he said, What? I said, They're in the Torah. Right, That's right, where right, they are. Right, right. So, you know, for right. me, it's in the Torah. The same thing. Right. Absolutely. So we're not here in court. Right, we're here as human beings giving testimony about our experience, but not testimony that's to be judged, but testimony that's to be heard and connected to. So here's the testimony. So I gave you like a few snippets from Exodus 19 and 20 just to see, you know, what 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 do we think the Israelites are experiencing? And we have a lot of midrashim that help us understand or point the way to what they may have been experiencing. So Bahar Sinai Ashan Kulo, Bibne Asher Yarana Lab Adonai Baish. So now Mount Sinai uh, was all in smoke, for Adonai had come down upon it in fire. Uh, and the smoke rose like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled violently. Let me just close the door to the room. So, okay, second verse. The blare of the horn grew louder and louder as Moses spoke. God answered him in thunder. Or God, and literally, God answered him with a voice. So, you know... <laughs> This is really extraordinary um, that there's a shofar here. And I never realized this until I was at the JCC teaching on, on Shavuot night, on Thursday night. And someone said, who was blowing the shofar? I'm like, oh, I never <laughs> thought of that. Like, why is the shofar blowing? What's that? Go what's, like, what's going on there? So tell you the truth, I didn't have time to actually investigate that question. I don't know. Um, the other interesting thing here is yeah. that yeah. Moshe speaks. Moshe speaks to yeah. the right? So that's fascinating. Um, and God answers him, but doesn't say God answers him. It says God answers him with a voice, or maybe with thunder. So what kind of conversation is that? Right? Fascinating. Okay, so I'm opening up more questions here than answers. I'm going to put some text on the table and then I'll open it up to all of you. 
So then Exodus 20, I, I, I skipped a bunch of verses while well, Moshe has gone up and down the mountain. Um, so this is the beginning of the quote unquote 10 commandments, what we refer to now as the 10 commandments. God spoke all these things saying, Sorry, let me just take away from the screen. Um, so I am Adonai, your God, who brought you out of Egypt, uh, from the land of Egypt, from the house of slaves. So this the way the first commandment, the first utterance begins, never ceases to capture my imagination. Like God starts with the word Anochi, I am. Right? It's a relational statement. It's not just you shall do this and that, but it's first I am. Right? So that where's the I am? Anochi. Anochi. Anochi is I am. Wh which line? Wendy, can you have a verse? Um, uh, and, and, and it's oh, ooh, there's the Anochi, um, which is an Egyptian word, which is related to an Egyptian word, yes. Mm -hmm. So, and it's it's a relational statement in the sense that God says, I am your God, right? Mm -hmm. Who brings you, who brought you out of Egypt from the house of slaves. So, it, it refers to the history of their relationship already. Okay, so now let's continue. And here, and I, I teach this often because I find it so, this, these next verses often, because I find them so interesting. And, and the relationship between God and the people really pivots with these next verses, and I'll explain how in a minute. So as soon as the people hear all the utterances, what happens? Exodus 20, 15 and 16, source four, all the people witness the thunder and lightning. So this is already interesting because they see, hi Alina, the people see the voices. Um, or the thunder and the torches, the torches. So it's it's you know, it's been described as a as a as an experience of synesthesia, right? They're seeing instead of hearing. Um, the blare of the horn or the the, the voice of the shofar, the mountain smoking, and when they <laughs> when the people saw it, so again, right? The word for seeing as opposed to hearing. Um, even though there's some visuals and there's some uh, sounds, um, they fell back and stu stood at a distance. And the yanu'u is also a word for um, movement or or maybe trembling, Jeremy? Movement, I think. Yeah. Movement. Okay, movement. So they stood back and stood at a distance. The yanu'u may rafa, right? So they're, instead of going towards this experience, they're moving back from it. Vayamru el Moshe, and they say to Moses, "Daber atatimanu, you speak to us, the Mishma, and we will listen." The al daber imanu Elohim penamut, but let God not, but let God not speak to us, or let not God speak to us, lest we die. So they're feeling threatened to, to their very core, right? If they have this connection to God, they're gonna die. And what happens, and I think this is also so, to me, moving, God actually hears this and never speaks to them directly again. Moshe becomes the intermediary. So Sinai, that experience is the only direct voice experience that they have. And they don't like it. They don't like it at all. And it also, you know, makes me think, you know, so again, we're looking at the testimony of their experience. This is their experience as reported by the Torah, right? Our experience is often, or what I hear is like, where is God? How do I connect to God? Where, what, you know, how do I have that kind of spiritual experience? And their experience is like, oh, right? So it's like, we're going towards and can't find anything. And for them, it's totally overwhelming. So that's the first part of it. 
right? So the <laughs> synesthesia, which maybe they were so overwhelmed they actually couldn't hear. Maybe that was it, right? Or, you know, why are they seeing when they're hearing a sound? Like, what's that? Is there some kind of, you know, it was so overwhelming that they they just couldn't take it in? Yeah, Asher Chaim. You have your hand up. Just a quick, that people, when they say they want a direct experience of God, are imagining a warm, fuzzy parenting mm -hmm. God, as opposed to the ferocious, terrifying God we often see in the Torah. So you want it, you want it, but if you have it, it could really be not what you were hoping for. Interesting. Yeah, Beware for. of what you wish for. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And we're going to see more texts about like that experience, the overwhelming, dramatic experience, as opposed to these other kinds of experiences in the Torah and beyond of like the gentleness, like that gentle, loving, soft, quieter God, which may be the one that we could tolerate, Ashokayim. So that's really interesting. Okay. So here's a midrash from Exodus Rabba. Um, yes. I mean, I have a comment. Quick. Quick. Quick comment. First of all, I believe it's all metaphor. I can't really believe that all this thunder and lightning and so on, people that wrote the Bible wanted out for to pass down the idea that it's uh, powerful and so on, because people coming out of slavery needed to be um, moved in a certain okay, way. Okay, let me just restate what you're saying to make sure I get it. Carry it for now. So let me just make, restate what you're saying to make sure I get it for now. So none of this really happened, but the, some writers of the Torah had this strategy for slaves understanding that something happened. So they wrote the story down. Is that what you're saying? That is, it, I'm thinking about the editors of the Bible. Okay, so I can a, write whatever I want. And so print it they made the story it has nothing to do with the collective experience. All right, so that's a kind of minimal reading as opposed to a maximal reading of this text. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go on. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I think you made your point. Um, I'm going to go on for a little while and then I'll call on you, Jay. Okay. So here's a midrash. Said Rabbi Abahu in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, when the Holy One gave the Torah, no bird screeched, no fowl flew, no ox mooed. None of the Ophanim, the angels, flapped the wing, nor did the Srafim, the celestial beings chant Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. The sea did not oh. roar. I'm in source five. Okay. And none of the creatures uttered a sound. Yes, hey. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> Throughout the entire world, there was only a deafening silence as the divine voice went forth speaking. Anochi, Adonai, Elohecha, I'm the Lord your God. So, I think what they're saying here is that everything stopped and then God spoke. Not that there wasn't the, the, what, what are they trying, the what, silence. What are they trying to explain? That that's why it sounded so loud because there was si otherwise silence. What is what? I, I, I'm, yeah. What is what is the the question that they are answering here. Yeah, I don't know. I have a thought. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sort of the thing they're afraid of is just losing the sense of self and separateness. And when you don't have any sense of self and separateness, there is no sound either. So that's part of the fear they have of letting... losing themselves. Yes. In this experience. And also you know what? the same thing is true there. Yeah. yeah. There's more about the silence. So let's yeah. see if we can get somewhere on that. Um Franz Rosenzweig in Revelation of Law, published in On Jewish Learning, and says, Revelation is certainly not law giving. It is only this revelation. The primary content of revelation is revelation itself. He came down on Sinai. This already concludes the revelation. He spoke is the beginning of the interpretation. Mm -hmm. So that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. That's what she's saying. Yeah. So there's this presence 
But then as soon as you give language to what happens after that, it's interpretation, according to Franz Rosenborn, Hugo's Um Okay, a few more and then I'll call on some people. So here's um, some Hasidic understanding. Only the first letter of the commandments, the Aleph of Anochi, I am, was spoken by the divine voice. Aleph signifies the number one, referring to the unity of all in Adonai. So there's this idea also in the Midrash that the Aleph was spoken by God and the rest of it was spoken by Moshe. And Gershom Sholem says, what sound is in the letter Aleph? Just silence at Sinai, just silence. To hear the Aleph is to hear the silence, the preparation for all audible language, but which in itself conveys no specific meaning. So it is really interesting that the utterances begin with this letter Aleph, right? Which, you know, doesn't have a specific sound to it. So is it the silence that underlies all of language? I still don't know the answer to your question, uh, Alan, but, but we, <laughs> let's see what unfolds and see if we can come back to that. Um, okay, so that was seven. All right, so I'm going to stop here, take a few comments, and we're going to go to some uh, Midrashic sources, which talk more about the experience at Sinai. Okay, Jay was waiting, and then Barbara. Um, wow, I don't know where to begin. I think the key two things. One, look, we're a content-obsessed tradition, and this is about an emotional moment. It's about synesthesia. It's about experience. And this is really one of the times in the Torah where that's being communicated. And that to me is very, very powerful. Um, a hat tip to Rav Asher Chaim, who came into the uh, gap of very little a paucity of anything uh, Shavuot on Zoom. And he had his, his, ran a study session. And at one point we studied this text um, guided by uh, a source sheet in Hadar. And I'm glad to see that Barbara's here because um, we heard an amazing performance, uh, a, a composition of hers, which tries to capture that moment. And I yeah. want to just pay some respect to that aspect of the text here, which is, to quote Rosenzweig, not about content, but about revelation, about experience, about synesthesia, about fear, sound, lightning, and, and that's a very, very powerful moment, I think, in our text. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Jay. Barbara. Hi. Uh, thank you, Jay. Um, you mostly said <laughs> what I was going to say because I was responding to, to Rosenzweig's, um, you know, almost like when you have a, 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 a huge experience one is struck dumb that's uh something that i i think you know we question why there isn't sound or uh, but but you know they talk about you know the incredible silence after the the bombs in uh hiroshima and nagasaki for example were struck dumb by these unbelievable experiences, great ones and terrible ones. Um, and and also <clears throat> that same idea, things are experiential. We, we as Jews often want to put so many words on everything. And sometimes things don't need words or explanation. They just are. That's Thank you, Barbara. Maybe we could spend the rest of the session in silence. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm going to read a couple of comments here. So from David Sigman, Sigman, and David, I met your lovely daughter-in-law recently. Um, David says, is it possible that God's love for her creation counterbalances her dangerous divine power? Or is the pantheistic God devoid of any human type empathy or affect? 
So that's a great question. And I think it also relates to, again, how we experience God, because there are moments in the Torah and certainly beyond, because God becomes gentler, you know, as history progresses. Like the Talmud has much subtler understandings of God and images of God than the Torah does. So, and, you know, I love this image in the Talmud itself that God struggles between Midat Hadim, like the angry, more judgmental aspect of God, and Midat Harachamim. So it seems like those aspects are there, and that there's some kind of, at least as the Talmud tells us, some kind of struggle about which one to express at any one moment. Um, and I want to say that we might also be a con our containers too small. Our containers too small. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. So. What's our container? And and that's what the Israelites were saying. We just looked at that. They're terrified. I'm too small for this. I'm going to get overwhelmed. I'm going to lose my identity. And the other thing I want to read from David is that uh, the people needed to fill in the terrifying void of revelation with language. To you, God, silence is praise. Beautiful. So, yes, I think we often, you know, is speaking, is all of speaking, all of words, because we're too afraid of the silence? It's an interesting question. <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't boil down all language to that, but I often feel like we fill the silences and the spaces between us with much too much, many, far too many words. Even allowing the pauses between sentences is challenging. Right, think about the silence after a song, which is so beautiful and sort of reverberates, right? And so he still some moments of still feeling that song and the silence. Okay, I'm gonna do a few more texts and then I will call on the people waiting to uh, speak. So here's a beautiful text. And yeah, I see you, Beth, I see you, Stuart. Just hold on for um let's see, we're gonna do oops. Nine and ten. Then we will call. Okay. Time check. Okay, we're good. Okay, so this is one of my favorite midrashim, along with a lot of others. <laughs> um, and it says, "I'm just thinking how much of this I should read in Hebrew." But okay, we'll start. Go er each hakol Come and see how the voice would go out among all of Israel. It's a call Israel, every single one of them according to the capacity. Mm. But it's interesting because this is a direct tension with what we just saw in the Torah. It overwhelmed the capacity. They couldn't take it. But Rabbi, this, could you screen share, it, please? What? Oh, screen share. Yes, I'm totally, thank you. Thank you for interrupting me. Okay. Okay, so here let's go. We are in eight. Number eight. Uh, okay. Do people see it? Excellent. <clears throat> okay. Um, and it goes on, right? Everyone according to their, their capacity or according to their strength. Haskenim lefikochan. You know, the elders according to their capacity. Habachurim lefikochan. The younger people, the younger men according to their capacity. Haktanim lefikochan. The little ones, the children, according to their capacity. <laughs> Even the babies, you know, according to their capacity. <laughs> and the women, according to their capacity. <laughs> and even Moshe, according to his capacity, as if he had capacity. But here we're told, yes, even Moshe has capacity. <laughs> as we just saw this, right? Moshe speaks. And God responds to him with a voice. And, you know, we saw before, we didn't need that word, the call voice. So what is it there to indicate? What is it there to teach? The call, shehaya, yacho, wasofla, the voice that he could stand. He could stand. And anyone who's a teacher or a parent or even a person, just a person in the world, knows that people around them have capacity to hear certain things they say and not other things they say. Right, often my husband says, I'm like, I can't take this in right now. I, can't, I, can't, I, can't, I just can't take it in. It's too late at night. Try me tomorrow. I can't take it in my head. Right? And I, I can't. I can't. I've left it. And it feels like a physical limitation. 
So I'm always thinking, I mean, there's the truth, or what you think is the truth, and you want people to know what's right. And there's the, like, how can I translate this in a way that the other can take it in? It took me a long time to figure out that principle, but it's very helpful. Um, just because otherwise people aren't hearing what you're saying, right? So it's just like, it makes, whatever. It just better, more real com communication, in my experience, results from it. I'm always thinking about what does the other person have capacity to hear? Mm -hmm. Okay, so God seems to be thinking in this midrash in that direction as well, <laughs> which is such a beautiful image. The chen hu omer kol anai bakoach. So it says in Psalms, the voice of God is in power. Bikocho lo neemar ella bakoach. It doesn't say in his strength, but it says in strength. So it doesn't say God's strength, but it says in strength. Bikocho shal kol achad echad. According to the strength of every single one, of every single person, and then get this, and even the pregnant women, according to their capacity, which is either very great or very small, I'm not sure which one. Uh, heavy Omer Hence, one would say each and every one according to his capacity. And then we have a whole beautiful, beautiful proof text here that I'm not going to go into word by word, but mana. So they're saying, like, if that's, you know, if it's true, if you wonder about this, if you're having a hard time believe it, believing it, but look at what we know about mana. What do we know about mana? That mana tasted, you know, for every single Israelite, what they needed it to taste like. Mm. So the elders and each one has a proof text because there are all these different verses about mana, right? So um, for the young men, it tasted like bread. For uh, the elders, it tasted like a wafer and honey. Um, for the sucklings, like the milk of its mother's dress, right? So it's just it's just a beautiful, and the way it weaves the proof text together, you know, from all these different comments about mana is just gorgeous. Uh, and then it ends by saying, is this the mana which was one type switched to many types because the need of each and every one, all the more so, the voice that had strength in it would change for each and every one so that they would not be fulfilled. And that's interesting because that shows some understanding by the rabbis that the voice can injure. It's that powerful, right? The voice, and, and just, and they're reflecting what the Israelites said, said the voice can kill you. The voice can kill you. Okay. All right, two more texts, and as I said, I will open it up. Okay, Shir Hashirim Rama. So Shir Hashirim is such a beautiful book, and it's a, it's a book of erotic love poetry, and the rabbis see it, and I think for some good reasons I won't go into now, as a book about the love story between God and Israel. Okay, so here, and they use it specifically for the experience of Sinai. So Amar Rabbi Yochanan, and this is nine, source nine, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Ma'ach Haya Motzia Dibur Miyotnei Hakadosh Baruch Hu, Al Kol Dibur with Dibur. An angel would bring out each utterance before the Blessed Holy One, one by one. Umachziro Al Kol Echad Echad Yisrael, Va'omer Lo Mekabel Ata Alecha Echa Dibur Hazeh. So they would bring out each utterance before the Blessed Holy One, one by one, and to each Israelite, every single Israelite, the angel would bring the utterance and say. Do you accept upon yourself this utterance? So there's a personal negotiation between every single person and God's utterances. Mm -hmm. And the sages say, the utterance itself would go out to each and every Israelite, and she would say to them, do you accept me upon yourself? I have within me such and such commandments and these judgments and these and those punishments and those and these decrees and these other commandments, some of them easy and others difficult, and these within me, Give different rewards. And the Israelite would say, these and these, and immediately the utterance would kiss him on the mouth. 
<laughs> what a sweet image, right? What an unbelievably sweet image of that every single you know, utterance, negotiating with every single person. So they're like, can you accept this? This is gonna work for you. Like, oh, honoring my father and mother, that's a tough one. I think I'll get rid of that one. <laughs> okay, next. All right, now, Lahavdia, right? It's kind of the opposite. So we're gonna get a little bit of vertigo, or not vertigo, whiplash at this moment, because in the Talmud, there's a very famous Midrash in Shabbat 88a. Hold on, that's right. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. Where it says, the So it said that the Israelites stood really right underneath the mount, right? Right underneath the mountain. So what does that mean? How do they explain that? How do the rabbis explain that? And remember, the rabbis don't explain things any worth any one way, which means we get a million ways. So we can have these images of gentleness and their opposite if we're back again. Amar Rav Adit Avdimi Barachama Barachama Kasa. Kasa. Okay, so Avdimi Barachama Barachama said, Milamed Shekafa HaKadosh Baruch Hu Alem Et HaHar Kigiyin. So this teaches us that God took the mountain and turned it over and held it above their heads. The Amar Lahem, Im Aten Mekablim HaTorah Mutah. If you accept Torah, good, it's better. The Im Lav and No. Sham to hey wow. So if not, I'm dropping the mountains on your heads, and this will be your burial place. Wow. Intense, right? And there's something about Sinai that reads like that. Like it's an overwhelmingly compelling bad. experience or threatening, or you know, uh, Amar. Yeah, I know you don't like this. Um Amar Rao Achabar Yaakov Yukam Moda Raba. Or writer. So uh, from here, there's a substantial caveat to the obligation to fulfill the Torah. In other words, there's a challenge here because if you're forced to do something, you you then don't have any choice, right? There's no, uh, you know, it's if if you're if in business, if you're forced to do something, then you're not bound by it. Amar Rava, Afal Bichem. So that's the challenge they they raise to um, this moment. Like if they didn't accept it willingly, willingly then there's something uh, that's um, delegitimated about the whole contract. Marava Afal Bichem, Hador Kabluhu Dine Achash Veyosh. But then no, later on in the Book of Esther, they actually accepted things. Right, and what's really interesting is that they're citing the book of Esther in contrast to this moment. I'll explain why in a minute. Let me just finish this text. kimu v'kiblu ayudim. So it says there that they, that the 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 Jews fulfilled and accepted. And here it says the way they're interpreting that line there in the book of Esther is kimu mashi kiblu far that they fulfilled what they already received a long time ago. In other words, it took them generations to actually process what happened at Sinai and to accept it willingly. Only the Jews of Persia. <laughs> All right, we're not reading this historically. <laughs> we're reading this theologically and literarily. <laughs> uh -huh. But it doesn't explain the, uh, you know, the rest of that. Yeah. Most were there. What? Most, Most were there. there. So, you know, that. Let's just talk about the developmental progression that the Talmud is referring to here. So what's fascinating is that even, so what they're saying is like, okay, you couldn't take it in there. Then it, you experience it like force. And that does um, inauthenticate the contract. So the contract's no good. But in generations, you figured out, yeah, you wanted to be in this relationship and you wanted to accept the Torah upon you. And the book of Esther is interesting because it's the, it's the one book of the Torah that doesn't mention God, right? And there it says the Jews, you know, they instituted holidays. Like they they had agency. They're like, yeah, you know, we understand like what mitzvah is and we're going to command ourselves and command the people. So there's that developmental arc now. Okay, and this is so, this text is so intentional, the text of like, Ah, the angel, you know, every everyone, you know, according to their own capacity, right? And and the angel negotiated with every single person what they would receive, what they would not receive. Here it's like, uh-uh-uh, like a mountain was about to be dropped. 
head. <laughs> right. So again, I'm asking questions about what was the experience at Sinai? What was the experience of God? What testimony do we have here? And also asking, like, what's our experience? And going back for those of for anyone who didn't see the poem at the beginning, if you weren't here at the beginning, um, the poem about like, you know, do you believe that God gave the Torah at Mount Sinai? Well, it depends what you mean by God, it depends what you mean by Mount Sinai, it depends what you mean by Gabe. Right. So, you know, um, I think we can receive experience as some kind of testimony that something happened to human beings, even if or, or human beings experience something, even if we don't believe this literally, which is like my principle and my approach to the Torah. OK, so people are waiting. We're going to Beth. Shabbat Shalom. I have two things. Um, the first has to do with this idea of uh, God threatening to drop the mountain on us. It doesn't say when God is going to do this. And so far, it appears that God hasn't dropped the mountain on us. But we know from Pirkei Avot in chapter 6 that there is a bot call possibly an echo might be the way to translate it or a reverberation that comes from the mountain. There's a voice every day that says something to the effect of, oy va voy, these people aren't keeping my Torah. Oy va voy. And so if we can hear that little voice, it's possible that we can overcome this idea of the mountain dropping on us. That's one point I wanted to make. And the other point has to do with being overwhelmed by the sounds and experience at the revelation. We do indeed have uh, the capacity or limitation, depending on how you want to look at it, of feeling overwhelmed. And yet, we can't actually perceive everything anyway. For example, here are my human ears right here. I can pick up certain sounds with these ears, but my horse, who's, you know, these great big ears, he can hear way, way more than me and from much further distances away. And my dogs can hear things that I can't hear and they can smell things and they can see things. So in spite of the fact that the people were overwhelmed, they weren't even hearing or seeing at all. The right. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Our, our. I'm not. I'm not. I can't call on people that have spoken already. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, we're limited. Each one of us is subjective and has limited capacity, and that's why. That's one of the reasons why it's so important to pay really close attention to what other people hear, because what other people hear and experience, we can't. We haven't, and that's how we sort of expand. Okay, so I just want to other people hear we. We can't. Like I don't always hear what you hear, so I want to hear from you what you hear, what you experience, because I. But you think you can use it if I hear it? I think I have some access to it. I grow by way of it. I don't exactly hear it, but there's something that expands, which I I think is why we study Torah. We connect to ancient voices that we don't have access to directly, and we connect over them and so everyone's experience in a sense we all all our consciousness expands yeah in that way i think that's the spiritual practice here so to speak okay so i see tomas i see three people on screen i have to end at uh, 9 45 or latest 9 50 because i'm reading services so i'm going to ask people to be as brief as possible because i still want to do a couple more texts so we're going to Stuart, marilyn uh jill tomas and then i'm going back to the text go ahead Hi everyone. Yeah, so to me, the, this all uh, feels like a, a, a basically a, a trauma reaction. When uh, we've been in slavery for hundreds of years, and we all have these uh, protective uh, mechanisms that we shut down throughout the experiences that we've had. So, in order to release trauma, you have to create that safe container for people to go through the shaking that needs to happen in order to discharge so then you can receive and build a bigger container that that's comes from a place of of love and uh 
and, and being able to receive so that we can then bestow. So there's something missing here in my estimation from what I work with people who've been through major traumas, what you need to allow that shaking and discharge to happen so it doesn't become life-threatening, life and death, like it's been expressed here, is that the community somehow needs to help each other. We're not getting the sense that the people are, like in our trauma work, we actually oftentimes have to hold somebody while they're going through that deep shaking so that they can feel the love and the safety. And that's, apparently, that's not happening here so yes, there, there's right. something that still needs to happen here in our collective healing. I'm going to respond and, and move on. So I think actually that the 40 years in the desert is that holding. But that's the containment. That's like a whole other thing. But that's where they're held and sustained daily. And they have a really hard time accepting it, right? So I, I think, and, and it's interesting that the prophets look on that period later as a love story between God and the Israelites. That's the romance. So I think there is a holding there. But that hasn't like, happened yet. That 40 years is yet to come. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, Marilyn. Uh, yes. I mean, I just sort of had a revelation, which maybe is obvious to everybody else, but it just sort of was new to me as I was listening to this, that, okay, so there's this um, experience where everybody hears it in their own capacity and understands it in their own capacity. And then that gets um, recorded, that gets written down into the Torah. And we think of the Torah as something that's, um, you know, contained, but somehow the whole Torah now becomes um, interactive and like Asher Chaim said, multifaceted. That's, the miracle to me is not only that um, they experienced it that way, but also that somehow it got written down in such a way that it contains all of the understandings and all of the responses and allows all the midrash to be possible. Yeah, beautiful. So the voice, the voice hasn't stopped. Right? That's the idea behind Torah. Or one of the ideas of the that, you know, we have this document, we have this testimony, and that by our uncovering meanings, we're still hearing the revelation. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, Jill. Uh, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. I just, uh, my my comment I wanted to say, and I don't know if anyone else has seen it this way, in some way, it is actually very beautiful that the people were overwhelmed and they said, okay, Moses, please take this. And first of all, it's a communal decision to say, look, Moses, please help us, you know, understand what's what's going on here. We're, we're overwhelmed. So the whole community comes together and and decides that. Um, and then also the feeling of being overwhelmed. I don't know about any of you, but when I've experienced God at the, you know, even what, however you want to, whatever adjective you want to use, but when I feel very, very, very close to God, it can be overwhelming. It can be overwhelming in a really good way, but if it's something that you've never experienced before, um, there's a certain really beautiful humility in saying, hey, can you please just take the load for a moment and then come back to us and we'll all experience this. That's Debarti. So, yeah, and and it strikes me that when the Israelites, and this is in response to Stuart as well, when they say don't let God speak to us anymore, let just Moshe speak to us, they're taking care of themselves. Like we can't tolerate this and how courageous it must have been for them to ask for a shift, right? Like when you're in an overwhelming, when I'm in an overwhelming experience, I often feel like I have no choice, but to actually say, hey, this is, I, I don't think I can tolerate. Can we make this change? That's amazing. Okay, Tomas. So just very briefly, we think of revelation as education and something in response to learning. Um, 
I can't resist sharing the two things that I was taught about how to teach. Yeah. Um, I, I teach architecture off of Columbia, and nobody teaches you how to teach. You just have to right. figure it out. Right. But I only got ever got two pieces of advice in 10 years. The first was start off me. And this is like middle school um, substitute teacher logic where, where you have to <laughs> sort of come in tough. Otherwise, somehow, you know, you'll be taken advantage of. But actually, there's something. Well, that's interesting. So God's starting with me. Yeah, start with me. But, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but I don't quite that. mean that in the Judeo-Christian way. I mean that like start off saying the stakes are very high. Yeah. This is very serious work we're doing. Um, um, it's very structured. It's very like you start off with high stakes and high structure. And that is very, very orienting and like a little bead. Um, but but somehow, um, you know, the beauty of a sharp knife. And the second piece of advice, again, in 10 years, only two pieces of advice. The second piece of advice was be comfortable with silence. Ooh. Because as a teacher, it's very tempting to just to like think of it as a social space and like answer the question you just asked or like. And and so with my students, you know, I'll, I'll put a question out there and I'll just sit and it becomes so awkward and they're so shy. <laughs> Not like this class where everyone has something to say. <laughs> just hold silence. You hold and hold and hold silence. And at some point, you know, somebody breaks it. Um, and, and that's when it begins. Um, and so I can't help but be reminded of these two principles of teaching within the context of revelation mm -hmm. about and then, of course, by the end of the semester, I say, no, this isn't mean. The stakes were actually very low. It was all about just doing your best and trying. And, and then it's very noisy. Uh -huh, it's it's a revelation. Yeah, yeah, sure. But anyway. It becomes the time of Esther. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, I'm not taking any more comments. We only have five minutes left. I'm sorry. I'm going to share my screen. So that sounds like a great reveal at the end of the book. I think I hope we do. Okay. Oh, okay. okay, so um we can't do everything, and I, I I recommend that people look at other texts that are really beautiful and interesting on, on the page. But I want to go to Deuteronomy because Deuteronomy has such a different understanding and presentation of what Torah is. So we're in source 12. And it says here, so remember Deuteronomy is all in the human voice, right? It's Moshe giving over, repeating a lot of what happened in the Torah and preparing his people to move, you know, from the Straits of Moab into the promised land, right? So we already see that, that sort of progression of gentleness in the Torah itself. We move from the omniscient narrator to the human voice, and so we are in the human hearing from the human voice about what Torah is, and it's so different than the experience in Sinai. Ki ha mitzvah hazot asher anochi mitzavcha hayom lo nifleti mimcha v'lo rachokahi. Surely this instruction, which I enjoyed upon you this day, is not too baffling for you, nor is it beyond reach. It is not in the heavens that you should say, who among us can go up to the heaven and get it for us? And imparted to us that we may observe it. It is not beyond the sea. Ever hayam di kacheha. Who among that that we should say who among us can cross to the other side of the sea and get it for us um, and impart it to us that we may observe it. Biyashmi enu, biyashmi enu ota bina asena. Rather, he karov elecha hatavar maor b'ficha uvil vavcha la asoto. No, the thing is very close to you in your mouth and in your heart to observe it. See, I set before you this day, life and prosperity, death and adversity. So whatever this means, and that could be a whole conversation that maybe we'll have when we come around to this parsha. It's not in the heavens. 
it's not coming from, you know, up there, not an up down kind of relationship. No, it's very close to you. It's in your mouth and your heart to observe it. Like, so it, it shifts from outside to inside. Like the source of whatever this is is within us. Okay, so I'm going to read one more text. So this is from Kings, and it's about Elijah. Um, and it's also a very famous text, and I'm going to pick up. This is number 13. And Elijah has uh, a mystical experience, and I'm going to go from verse 8. He rose and he drank, and with the strength from the meal, he walked 40 days and 40 nights as far as the mountain of God at Korah, which is also Mount Sinai. So these are where his resonance is sort of like a retelling of the Sinai story um, in 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 a manner that's appropriate for prophetic literature. We'll see how it <clears throat> how it shifts radically. There he went to a cave and there he spent the night. He made Vardonai Ilah Then the word of God came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? You know, what's up with you? Why are you here? <laughs> so verse 11, um, I'm sorry, 10, he replied, I am moved by zeal to the eternal, the God of hosts for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, turn down your altars and put your prophets to the sword. I alone am left and they are out to take my life. So the stakes are high. <laughs> to say the Come out, he called, and stand on the mountain before God, and lo, God passed by. There was a great and mighty wind splitting mountains and shattering rocks by the power of God. But God was not in the wind. After the wind and earthquake, that God was not in the earthquake. Twelve. After the earthquake, fire, but God was not in fire. And after the fire, a soft murmuring sound, or really, mama is silence, right? So perhaps the sound of silence. Um, then when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his mantle about his face and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave of the cave. Then a voice addressed him, why are you here, Elijah? So again, what are you doing here? And he basically answers the same way. Um, so I'm not going to read that. Why did he answer the same way? I don't know why he answers the same way. But it seems like what God is doing here is reorienting Elijah, either successfully or unsuccessfully. So, you know, who is God? What is God? God is not in the noise god is not in the fire god this is like this is the anti-sinai revelation like god is not here god is not here god is not here god is in the silence or maybe in the soft more murmuring voice and no how could god not be anywhere anywhere that mm -hmm. well god is not what it says here is god is not in these things not in the wind not in the earthquake but god is in the sort of soft murmuring mm -hmm. sound well, well actually he doesn't have to be God, like addressing Elijah directly. I mean, of course, he's everywhere. Yeah. And I think prophetically speaking, God isn't addressing him through the wind. 
Right. What's the manifestation yeah. of God at that moment? Yeah. Um, and it actually doesn't even say that God was in the soil. After the fire, it says a soft murmuring sound. It doesn't even say that God was in that. It just says God is not in all these things. It's sort of like but it doesn't say that God was not in this. So that's interesting. Okay, so now it's, uh, it's about time to end. So I'm gonna I'm gonna leave you with one more thought, yeah. which is this. Um, to sum up, which I know it's impossible to sum up. So the last text on the page, it says, the Kutzka Rebbe was asked, why is Shavuot called Zman Matan Torah? Why is uh, Shavuot called the time of the giving of the Torah? Rather than the time the Torah was received. Mm. He answered, mm. the giving took place on one day, but the receiving mm. takes place at all times. Yeah. So, you know, we've seen a range of voices about what it means to receive Torah. We've seen voices from within the Torah itself about the experience, you know, the, the kind of violent nature of the experience and how the rabbis really soften it and make it almost into like a gesture of love, right? Um, so we've seen the Torah, we've seen how our ancestors interpreted Torah, and we've seen something about how we ourselves receive these voices. So it's sort of like a, a multiplying effect, right? A multiplying effect. And at any moment, we're sort of filtering all this in a way that we ourselves can receive whatever this is. So I wish you all a revelatory <laughs> Shavuot. <laughs> and may the revelation continue mm. um, and become alive in our own interpretations mm. in a way that maintains, you know, the power of silence, not only the power of word. Mm. Mm. Yeah. will continue. I mean, is it over? It's not over. Today. It, it ends tonight. Okay, bye.